before we get to today's show, and it's a great show, it's a great guest, and I don't want to take any time or attention away from today's guest, but I wanted to record this because I felt it was necessary. If you know me and you've been following me on social media or you've seen stuff that's come out in the last couple of weeks, you know what my big focus has been on for the last couple of days. And that's the, the unfortunate and unexpected passing of my friend, Ben Stimson. Um, it's been hard. <laughs> I wish I could say, you know, grief and, you know, people die every day and that you kind of, you know, get used to it. And especially with the pandemic, I think we all were faced with so much death that you would kind of think we were desensitized to it. But when someone of the magnitude of Ben passes away, it's still hard to deal with. And I finally found a moment, you know, where I felt strong enough to record this because I felt like it, you know, when people ask me, what's my story? How did I come who I am today in the cigar industry? Ben Stimson is a big part of that story. Now, he was never a guest on Deep Cuts Live, but he was very much a big presence here on Deep Cuts Live. Ben was many things to me. He was a co-worker. He was a friend. He was a mentor. Um, he was, you know, I'm selfishly probably going to say that he was my best friend. Um, and I was, you know, I, I hope I was his. And I tried to be um, for all the years that I knew him, which was just, you know, about nine years. But we worked together so much that he became uh, family. He became almost like an extension to me. Ben, you know, we, you hear about uh, all these celebrities, well, maybe back in the early 2000s, celebrities having these names like Benifer or Brangelina. Um, people, when we started working together at um, Spetcom International, so when we were doing Tobacconist uh, Magazine and Pipes and Tobaccos Magazine, people at the office would call Ben and I, Ben Tuan, we were like one person, like you would never kind of, if, if you couldn't find one of us, you would know to go to the other person's office and, and we would be there working on stuff. We were always working on projects. We were always creating. And that's kind of where I got this sense of, you know, I always ask people on Deep Cuts, where did you get your entrepreneurship from? Where did you get that, um, that drive from? I got mine from Ben. Ben was like that person where he, he, he was always chasing after something. He always wanted to build a business. He loved entrepreneurship. You know, he would read the books. He would listen to the podcast um, long before I was doing this podcast. He loved just learning and doing. Um, and even if he didn't know how to do something, like he would just say like, let's, let's, let's do it. Like, great. And then I was like, awesome. And then he would turn around and basically say, okay, now we got to learn how to do it. And we did. I mean, we created Cigars and Leisure magazine in 2000 and um, about 2014, 2015, that time frame. And we went from there to Tobacco Business Magazine. And we worked with the TPE trade show. At that time, it was called the um, Tobacco Plus Expo. And it's called Total Product Expo today. We always created stuff together. You know, a lot of this podcast that you see today with Deep Cuts Live kind of comes from my work and my time with Ben. So it's only appropriate, like I said, that we start off today's episode kind of acknowledging him in his passing. Like I said, the news hit me hard. I have definitely not been the same <laughs> since learning the news. Like I said, this is the first kind of strong moment. And maybe this has been kind of saying like, this is your moment. This is, you know, go ahead and, and embrace it. Cause that's what he was always about embracing the moment. You know, he taught me so much. And like I said, we were, we, you know, we evolved from being just coworkers to basically being family. Like he was that older, older brother. And if any of you have older brothers or even younger brothers, you know what that relationship is like. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it really grates on your nerves. Um, but you love each other despite it. And, you know, Ben Stimson was one of those people that honestly I loved. I couldn't, you know, and I still do. So it's even though he's not here, I can't help but to smile uh, when I think about him. And, you know, he's... Like I said, his presence will not go away. Like I will <laughs> always do deep cuts and any other thing that I do kind of with him in mind. Every time I put together a deep cuts live, I think of I think, what would Ben like to hear? Like what kind of question would he ask? Because he would ask really good questions of people that you wouldn't, you know, normally 
uh, think about. We were interviewing Eric Espinosa once and he was asking him, you know, like, well, what is it like being a leader? Like all these weird questions that you would, like weird, but at the same time, it's like really insightful. So he always approached things like he was a journalist kind of in merit, but he did his part. I mean, he really just contributed a lot, like I said, to me, and I know the lives of so many people. And he, like I said, it's, it's just been hard to believe that, you know, I, you know, I can't reach out and talk to my friend anymore. Um, you know, he would text that very odd times in the morning, but it was always nice sometimes to, to wake up and to see like, you know, he was just kind of thinking about you, uh, even if it was at two o'clock in the morning or something like that. He, you know, like I said, he just, he was just this great force. And a couple of days, you know, a couple days ago, his brother, you know, revealed to me that he, that, you know, that Ben watched Deep Cuts. He listened to Deep Cuts. And the funny thing is, whenever I talked to Ben about Deep Cuts, because we would talk about it a lot, because he was very interested, again, in the entrepreneurship and the podcasting. Um, he was always interested in, in what I was doing, but he never let on that he, you know, watched it. And to know that he was watching Deep Cuts, you know, in the background, um, this kind of goes with my theory when people say, like, how many people watch the show? How many people listen to the show? And I was like, I'm, I never know because I, I don't follow the numbers. You know, they, they I'm just doing the show because I know that there's people out there who love a good entrepreneurial story and just a good life story. And I hope they feel inspired by what they hear here, because I was always, like I said, crafting secretly the show to say, like, OK, for someone like Ben, what would they like to hear or what would they like to listen to? So I'm going to miss Ben. And I know some of you, hopefully, uh, you've, you know, not tuned out by this time because I want you to know what a great man he was, um, what a great father he was. He, that was his biggest accomplishment. What a great, tried to be the, the best husband that he could be, um, the best friend that he could be. If you were down and I was down a lot of the times that we were, you know, working together, he always tried to pick me up. So, you know, the other morning I was in my car, um, you know, driving and just thinking about what happened and, you know, thinking that I really missed him and, and you know, could have you really used him in that moment of sadness. And this song, Get Yourself Together by Robin started playing and I could just see Ben sitting in the car next to me, kind of dancing around, bopping around, because that was kind of like the relationship and the, the moments that we had. We always went on these grand adventures, um, big and small, you know, locally, and we, we went around the world together. I mean, but we went to Belgium, we went to, you know, just around. Um, and so, like I said, it, I wouldn't be the person I was without Ben. And I know he he's not able to to hear that, but I did try to tell him that often he was not the squishy, emotional type. So he would kind of cr probably cringe at this whole thing right now. And, you know, if his family is listening, I hope, you know, I hope I was the best friend to Ben that I possibly could be. And I really, like I said, I'm really going to miss him. And I know that his presence will never go away. I mean, he has two great kids that are, are still here. And I know that they're going to probably grow up to have his qualities and the best of, of him. Um, and for those of you who are wondering, like, if you haven't already, there is a scholarship fund set up to help. Teddy and Lily, his children. And I'm going to put the information here on the screen. So if you want to donate to the scholarship fund, it's at HTTP, HTTPS, everlove.com slash life dash of slash Ben slash Stimson slash donate. So that's a lot to take in, but it's definitely worth the effort. Like I said, he would definitely appreciate any support that you could have given. I would personally, I feel like this is like my final Thing that I can do for Ben, the final project that we, him and I are, are working on, which is to make sure that his kids are taken care of um, and his family, because that's all he wanted to do. That was his, you know, when I asked people at the end of Deep Cuts, why do you do what you do? That's, you know, that was his his why. It, it was his family. You know, he could, he, he may have told you it was, you know, for the money and stuff like that, but it, it wasn't. He, he did everything for his family. He wanted them to have the best life 
possible. And um, I hope to be able to help in whatever way I can in my lifetime, him to realize that. And also for you all who are listening and watching this podcast, if I can help one person out there through good content, like the interviews I do here at Deep Cuts Live, I would feel like, you know, I have done my job. That's, you know, it's not, uh, it's not about sponsorship money or free, you know, stuff. It's really about giving you uh, a blueprint, giving you inspiration to say, maybe, you know, I can take a chance and do something great. So thank you for enduring this very personal, like I said, spiel. Ben, I love you. Um, I hate that you're not here. It's not fair. <laughs> um, like I said, I, I still am grappling with my grief, but I know you would want me to keep going and you would want me to continue to do deep cuts and to make it the best that I can. And for everyone watching and for Ben, because I know he's still watching or listening, um, I just will leave you with what he used to tell me every morning when we first see each other um, in the office, which was, um, hey, make it a great day. Thank you. So welcome to Deep Cuts Live. I'm your host, Antoine Reed. And today we are here with Panda. That's how he wants to be introduced. <laughs> so, Absolutely. What's so, going on? Huh? Welcome to Good. Deep Cuts Live. Oh, yeah. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I was trying to figure out today, like, how did I want to start this interview? I know, uh, like, how many SCAR podcasts have you done so far? Well, let's see. So far... As you know, as for White Panda and myself together, not not a whole lot, not a whole lot. It's just the beginning, you know. Okay. Probably, I'd say like three or four. Okay. Four. Yeah. So, so they usually start off with um, the typical question of like, what are you smoking and stuff like that. So I'm going to start somewhere completely different um, right. to, to get this whole conversation kicked off in a weird direction, trajectory. Um, okay. Growing up... And I'll tell you the origin of this question later on. But growing up, did you have a favorite toy that you like to play with? Uh, yeah, actually there is. Oh yeah, absolutely. What it's, was it? Uh, <laughs> it's actually, uh, believe it or not, it's a BB gun. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you know, it's I'm, you know I was born and raised in China, right? And uh, mm -hmm. unlike here, you really can't even, technically speaking, you know, legally own a weapon. Right, but then you know, as 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 a boy, you always growing up, you know, from movies, all that stuff. So you are always trying to be the cool guy, all that stuff. So I was like, oh yeah, I mean, it, it probably could be like real close to to the real ones. So yeah, BB gun, and that that's definitely, yeah. Now now I think about it, it's just it's definitely, I, you know, I'm blessed that it's not iPad or you know a PlayStation. I know. I was like. You know, I was thinking the other day um, how different it is for, I guess, people. I don't know what age you are, but I know mm -hmm. at least my age group. It was like, like Paul Rubens died as we're filming this like a couple of weeks ago, like Pee Wee Herman. And I was just in, I was telling my mom one, one day when we were talking about it, I was like, I was on eBay looking at Pee Wee Herman action figures because I remember having them growing up and having like the Pee Wee's Playhouse. Like, right set like play set and i was just thinking like kids today don't have that like you don't have any cartoons and stuff so like you're saying like it's like they're everyone's raised on like devices <laughs> it's like oh yeah I don't know I mean, it's, it's just like think about it you know when we talk about it we have so many different answers right but now like with younger generation you're like am i even gonna ask because <laughs> it's gonna be probably ipad or like playstation or like you know nintendo stuff like that Exactly. Yeah. But the BB gun is a is a unique answer. It reminds me of a, a Christmas story. Uh with Ralphie wanting to shoot out his eye when he wanted the BB gun. He goes to that whole movie wanting oh. the BB gun and he gets it and then he, you know, almost shoots his eye out. So yep. <laughs> I remember I remember, oh yeah. I mean this uh, <laughs> we've uh, we've done some pretty things with those uh, small BB guns. It's it's just you know it's like now when you look back like I did that. 
<laughs> yeah, it's one of those moments. Yeah, so w with that great introduction to you, so I think people will look at you now and they'll, when they see you at a trade show or at an event, they'll probably ask you about the BB gun. So with that, uh -huh. introduce yourself to people and tell people a little bit about, you know, what you do in the cigar industry. So it's, you know, when, when, when first people saw me, you know, like regardless of trade show or like in a cigar shop, which is definitely something that you don't, you, you don't see every day, right? Like a Chinese who walk in the cigar shop, like, okay, what is going on? It's like, what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, so as far as for now, um, I'm the owner of White Panda, you know, uh, partner of with uh, Luciano. He's also actually uh, both my really close friend and also my mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, besides that, I pretty much, you know, uh, work a lot in selling Nicaragua, um, not just only on uh, blends, you know, blending cigars, but also, you know, working on fermentation on tobacco leaves and also check on farms to help out Luciano. And, you know, for, for at the same time, learning all the knowledge from him and also, you know, from working at the field. Now, as far as, you know, for, for the U.S. market, I'm pretty much you can say I'm a brand owner and also brand ambassador. Um, but, you know, before I, before I actually decided to start my own brand, I used to work at a shop in Memphis, Tennessee, you know, just for a registration to help out customers. I enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, just like trying to help people. It doesn't matter if it's their first time or they could be experienced cigar smokers. I just like to talk to people you know, about cigars and trying to match, you know, the best one for their, for their, you know, for their palate. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing that. So. so how did you originally get into cigars? Because a lot of people come on here and say like they, they learn from their, they got it from, you know, their grandfather smoked right. or their father smoked or. Right. I mean, this, this, <laughs> so this is definitely not one of those typical time. Of, oh yeah. I smell from the, you know, I love the cigar smell since I was a kid. Like, you know, people know I'm lying. Why tell <laughs> that story that way? Right. They're like, come on now, you're Chinese. Like, okay. So, uh, I have known that. All right. I have no family heritage. Um, Growing up, you know, I, I start to, I used to sort of smoke cigarettes while I was in China as a little kid. You know, it's wild country. Mm -hmm. And then for me, I really started getting into uh, cigars when I actually came to the States, you know, during my freshman year in college. Um, I actually went to this um, tobacco sh store called Mace Edward in Albert, Michigan. But I started there, like, I started going there as a customer who just buy cigarettes, tobacco leaves, like, you know, when you sit there and roll your own cigarettes, I start, I start by, you know, doing that. And then after a while, I started to see like, you know, they also have pipes and also they have uh, cigars. I was like, oh, it's, I've never had it before. You know, I've, I only saw this in movies, stuff like the shows. And, you know, the only thing I know, like, it's kind of like blurry by then. The impression I have of cigars, it's still in those like you know old um, like some of those western movies or like some of the you know the mafia movies. The the big boss always smoked cigar. Right. I was like, you know what? It's yeah. Let me let me let me experience that. You know, <laughs> I really want to feel how they feel. You know, in a movie. And uh, yeah, um, I didn't know back then. I was like eleven years ago. Yeah, I didn't know. Like, so I got the. Uh, yeah, I got the 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 open sex from Fuente. Right, but yeah, like, right. I didn't know. I didn't know how rare that is. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, this is nice. So I got a whole box. But the the the, the issue is uh I power through that like within like four or five days. Oh no. Without <laughs> knowing exactly what I was doing, right? And then when I went back, I said, oh, yeah, those uh, those are actually really good. Do you have more? And the owner looked at me like, what you mean? <laughs> what you mean do I have more? <laughs> what happened to those ones? I sold you. I was like, uh, I smoked all of them. Yeah, you should see his face. He is not happy. He's like, you know what? there's people like cursing my ass off because, you know, <laughs> because I, I sold the entire box to you. I was like, well, I didn't know. So 
you know, after that, I, that's when I really start to, like, the first time I got a conversation going, right, with because because of cigar. Um, so I, you know, after that, I start to try out different brands. You know, start off with mainstream like Ashton's or like uh, La Gloria de Cuba, um, and then also you know Macnudo stuff like that. But also because I, I guess. What what you know what leads me to the second or even third cigars is actually the conversation get carried, right from the first cigar even even though that was an instant, but you know the conversation we get from that it's it's really what pulls me towards it, and eventually you know take me like help me to actually you know take the leap of faith get in the industry. It's a conversation I'd say. Well, I, I like that you your your first cigar was the Opus, because <laughs> like most people say, like their first cigar was like a Swisher or right. you know, something else, yeah. or you know some other brand. You just started at like the top as the as the top of the tip top of the cigar industry. As right. You <laughs> I mean, Which and also you know that was like you know it was like back in 2012. So like right after I bought it, like you know there's the, the warehouse fire, all that. That's when the Angels here later on came out. So mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God, I have no idea what I've done. But now I look back, it's like, okay, that's uh, <laughs> that's something. I, I started I start off really good. <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, like, like, you know, like, I know that they, they probably looked at you as if it was a faux pas for you to smoke Opus X and to smoke all right. of it so quickly. But it's, it's almost, too, it's like you, you bought it to consume it and to, like, enjoy it. And that's what you did. So yeah, it's not like, really a bad I, thing. I, I was trying to tell myself that, but then, <laughs> you know, you know, like, come on, this is your first cigar. There's no way you could have really approach it the way they want you to. But regardless, I mean, you know, more or less, I definitely enjoy it. Otherwise, there's no way I can power through that that fast. Wow. So you, you started, like I said, you started at the top. You got to Opus X, and you talked about. Um, smoking these other brands, kind of well-known brands. Uh, I guess as a as a new, being new to the cigar world, did you ever, uh, like what was your perception towards brands that were, I guess, seen as boutique? Well, let's see. The first, hmm, that's a really good question because I, I, I'd say it takes me, it takes me some time to actually start to get into you know, even like start to get a chance to get my hands on boutique cigars. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, back then, I remember for the first, uh, I didn't say for the first three to four years, I was like trying to smoke cigars every day. And every day I smoke, when I smoke cigars, I'm trying something different. You know, it doesn't matter size or it could be the same brand, but, you know, different lines. Um, to, to pretty much like got me like some basic flavors. Right, basic flavor profile or like basic knowledge about cigars. Um, and then I remember the first, technically speaking, the first actual boutique cigar I've ever smoked. It was, uh, I had to say, I had to say Roman Craft back oh. in 2000, yeah, back in 2014, 13 or 14, when I met, uh, you know, Mike, uh, Michael Rossells. Um, it's, you know, when they, when they first released their intemperance to the public, mm-hmm. that's, you know, I smoke, I thought, oh, wow, it's, you know, first of all, it's back then, you know, the price was really friendly and uh, the flavor is just impactful. I was like, how did you do that? Because, you know, before I really get into boutiques, I always think, oh, it's like, you know, the price you pay equal to, you know, equals to the quality of the tobacco that you use. That's that's always in my mind, right? But then you know, with with smoking a boutique cigar where it's not expensive as a lot of other brands, you still have a lot of flavor. It just like blow me away. Now, yeah, that was actually the technically speaking the first boutique cigar I've ever smoked. And you know, after that, I just start to getting no. Oh, there's actually more than I thought. To to you know to 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 be waited to. To be uh, explored by me, so it's you know that 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 just like 
eventually leads me to all the decisions I live later on made, you know, all these years on the road. So. So, so what steered you towards these particular brands? Because I know that people who are new to cigars, like one of the handicaps that they have um, is that they come into the industry not knowing anything about brands, you know, right. so, you know, they don't always uh, have a good relationship with their tobacconist or the person that sells them the cigars. So mm -hmm. they kind of don't have that, that great experience. But you start off with like all the brands that you're naming are kind of like, you know, pretty well-known brands. So like, like how did you, how did you learn about these brands and like what you were kind of going after and what you were buying? I mean, I started with, well, you know, after that incident with open sex, right? And then, you know, I really start to get to know the basics, you know, like uh, uh, Magnudo, um, La Gloria de Cubano, or like Tatuai, my father, Ashens, brands like this. <clears throat> Like, you know, it's, 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 I'd say I got it by, by trying them all, like one by one. You know, I never try to stay with the same cigar. I would definitely take notes, you know, if I really like some. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, remember this, like back then, my English wasn't even that good either. So like sometimes like, I have a hard time to remember the names. So like sometimes if I go to a cigar shop, I was trying to describe the band stuff like that, and then the stuff mine points me to a you know a different brand that the band looks really similar, mm -hmm. but it's a different brand. Like sometimes I try new brands by that you know by accident like that too. Oh, um, but I I actually you know we 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 one one think about it. I actually just. I keep trying different stuff every day and build up basic knowledge. And then, you know, after about two years in, that's when I really start to have my own. I, okay, I know exactly, okay, what type of flavor I like, what kind of flavor I'm not like. You know, you start to really start to lay basic foundation about, you know, on cigars. And then, you know, it's, it's became easier and easier for me at least. Do you have a particular um, size that you kind of gravitate towards? Oh, uh, Toro. Well, back then it was Toro. Back then it's Toro. Now it's more like Corona Grotto mm -hmm. because you know Corona Grotto is it's it's smaller ring gauge for sure, but also it's a little bit bigger ring gauge than the Torpedo or like uh, another uh, like the bigger ring gauge than than like a Lancero or like a typical Corona. Which you know that is my sweet spot. I got like you know I got the size, which lasts me longer, right? And also I got flavor as well. So. Awesome. Um, so at what point did Nicaragua kind of come into play? Well, about a year ago. Well, a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, I'd say, because I mean. Um, before that, I only know that, oh, there's, you know, cigars from the Republic, of course, Cuba, Honduras, and Nicaragua, right? Mm -hmm. But then, um, by that time, I only been to Cuba and DR. Um, I got some ideas about, you know, how the cigars being made, all that stuff, but that's about it, right? I don't know nothing else. Now... Fast, fast forward, like I, you know, so last year I started really thinking about if I really want to do a brand, a cigar brand that, you know, making cigars that, first of all, I enjoy smoke, um, then I really need to learn everything, right? So I was like, okay, but, you know, where where I need to go? So um, I think it's like ever since COVID, like the Nicaraguan tobacco has been really starting to take off, like, you know, caught people's attention. Mm -hmm. so I was like, you know what? I've already been to DR. Okay, that was, you know, that was that was nice, but I'd like to try something different. So oh, maybe it's time for me to explore Nicaragua. And uh, yeah, but see, it's, it's I, I feel like sometimes I always do pretty things like this because to me, like Nicaragua was just a country. I don't even know, like back then, I don't even know where Nicaragua is. Right, but I just know that okay, I need to go there. So I booked my flight, got my Airbnb, 
and actually hired a guy online as my, you know, as my tour as you know translator. I just go. Didn't even think about anything else. Now when I look back, I was like, yeah, if that guy decided not to show enough, <laughs> which he probably have every single rest to do that, there's nothing I can do about it because I've already paid, right? But you know, I, I was lucky that uh, he showed up. But you know, every everything, everything changed after that first first time I was in Nicaragua. You know, didn't know nobody, don't know the language, but still, I decided to go and uh, you know meet uh, meet a lot of really meet a lot of uh, interesting characters there, and some of them are really close friends of mine. Now and yeah, ever since that, I just going back and forth between here in the States and Nicaragua. It's, but whenever I'm going there, I'm, that means I'm learning. Working and learning, I just say. It's, yeah, it's, it's definitely not like, it's, it's not a typical tour, like, you know, for, for tourists. Right. It's, right, it's, it's actually, you work just like them. People who live in Nicaragua, you work just like them, that's how you learn. It's funny because, um, uh, for those who have not been to either of these countries, mm -hmm. it's, it's, they are different. They have different vibes. And the cigar industry has different vibes in these two countries. Like, oh yeah, Dominican Republic is, is great. Um, but when you get to Nicaragua, it's like there's a factory almost everywhere, it feels like. And there's lots of choices. Um, right. In terms I, I just say Nicaragua is more raw experience yeah. in, a, in a way. Cause yeah, cause like, like I think it was like uh, more polished. I found right, like, right, polished. like you can definitely, Nicaragua. right. You can definitely tell the impression, like you know, the influence you get. You know, when you're in DR, you're like, oh shit. You know, there's a lot of places you can definitely feel like, okay, this is definitely being Americanized, which is you know, a lot of times it's a good thing mm -hmm. because it's more modernized and also it's easier to communicate. The chances for you to running into people who speak English is even higher. Right, where in Nicaragua, it's, once you're in Stali, like you better speak Spanish, otherwise, like yeah, no, like mm -mm, they don't they don't understand English at all. <laughs> so, yeah, but I mean, you know, it, it's um, like in Nicaragua, it's, you still you still need to know people in in order to actually get into the factory, all that stuff to learn the actual knowledge, to get the experience. I think it's great that you were willing to be bold enough to take that chance to say, like, I want to learn this this industry, uh, right. and I know I need to learn it by being hands on. And I'm going to go yeah. to this country that I'm not familiar with, <laughs> and and just and, and just see what happens. I think like like that's like uh, it, it takes a certain like I said type of attitude to do that because so many of us will find all the different reasons to say no, that's not a good idea, or I'm not right. going to do that. Um, and there's so many people in the cigar industry, you find too, that don't do that right away. Like, you know, they're ready to make a cigar brand. They're going to reach right. out to someone down there and kind of work it out, like find a partner. And, yeah, and I, 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 I definitely understand, you know, why people think like that. But, you know, I, I can do this fairly easy. I'd say it's probably because... You know, I've already did it once, right? I mean, when I first came to the States, I barely speak the language, right? It's still, I remember, like, the first day, it takes me, like, 15, 20 minutes to order a subway. <laughs> and it was lunch break. So, oh, no. yeah, that was that peer pressure behind me. I was like, right, but, you know, that, I think that was the actual first time, you know, for me to have, like, that kind of experience. Like, I don't know the country. I don't know nobody in this country. I barely speak the language, but I still need to do what I need to do, right? Because, I mean, I, I know where I need to go. So whatever it takes, I got to do it. I mean, I pretty much, I think now when I look back, I think that mentality helps me a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, we were with the first time I went to Cuba, the first time I went to DR, similar situation, you know. Okay, okay, I don't know nobody, but here's the thing. Like, it doesn't matter. What matters is... I need to go there and do things that's necessary because I know where I need to go. So everything else just follows, I think. 
So I'm curious, where did that attitude come from? That, you know, that boldness of, I'm just going to go and put myself into a situation that is going to make me feel very uncomfortable at, at times and it's not going to be easy, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Like, where does that come from? Oh, I guess it's, it's just really, it's, it's a couple of reasons. Like, you know, while I was in, used to it being China and then, you know, you, you live typically under a lot of pressure, you know, because you're a little bit under high expectation, either from school or from your family all that stuff. And, you know, you are, you're always trying to be this guy that follows all the rules and please everybody. Now, a lot of times it's, you did it after all the hard work and then you're exhausting, mm -hmm. right? And, but also at the same time, you even, you can't really show that to other people because that's, you know, that that's shows as a sign of weakness. But, you know, once I moved to the States, I realized that, well, it's, I've already had enough of, you know, being, trying to please someone else and, you know, trying to pretend doing something that, you know, oh, like make me happy. No, it's just because I just try to live the way I want to, you know, at least I don't know how for how long, but at least I got a chance to do it when I'm in the States, right? So I really just like, I'm going to enjoy that. And I know it's not always going to be pleasant at the first place, but it's okay. Because it's, I, I think to me, it's more important um, of, you know, being, you know, being, being, being free, like making choices freely, than, you know, running into issues, difficulties, challenges when you, you know, when you're growing after what you want. I think this is more important to even have that idea than, you know, because challenges, difficulties, of course, everybody runs into those every day, right? But it's it's actually at least you, every time when I think about at least I'm going through all of this for a purpose, you know, which is the purpose that I made it, I choose as a free person. That just, you know, help me to, to over through, overlook everything. It's not actually, it's not that bad, to be honest with you. I think, like I said, I think that's a, um, you make it sound easy, but I know it's not easy for people because there's, a, we all have something that we, you know, wish that we did. And they always say, just go out for it and, and do it. And yet it seems so right. easy and yet people don't do it. And there's people who are, you know, in their twilight years who still, you know, who wish they had gone out and done something and they just never did because a family member might have told them not to do it. Uh, they might not have had the support of their spouse or their boyfriend, their girlfriend. It's just, it's. it's yeah, I, I definitely understand that. But, you know, also at the same time, it's, they, they really start to look back. Then they start thinking, oh, I wish I could do this, this, this. That's actually the, the year they start to, you know, not giving a damn about other people. Right. I, I just, you know, I, I, I think um, they just hope that they could get that mentality when they were younger. I'm just, you know, I'm just lucky enough to realize that at the younger age. Exactly. Yeah. So working in, in Nicaragua, because you were saying that you, you know, you, you didn't just go there just to, you know, watch and observe. Like you were like work hands on with oh, this yeah. experience. So mm -hmm. what was that like? Because I've been to Nicaraguan factories and I tell people like, there's no way I would ever thrive. It's just not my kind of environment. Like I couldn't do right. that kind of work. So, so what was it like for you immersing yourself in that environment? Um, I think it's, it's like a bittersweet hundred percent because um, I'd be lying if I tell you those are easy work, right? I mean, I hate myself to a point where I have to like wake up, you know, 4.30 in the morning and then start getting work around five and then work all the way through until like 6.30 in the afternoon. And really you don't get a chance to eat because you are so busy, you know, like sometimes putting up tobacco leaves and check on tobacco leaves, you know, sometimes, you know, check on the soil, sometimes just work with people, like just like what they do harvest during harvest season. Those are not easy work, yeah. right? 
but also at the same time, um, I've never feel like I'm, you know, I'm alive as much as I was doing things that I love to do because um, every single small things I've done in Nicaragua, it actually helped me to realize that, uh, you know, I'm learning every day by doing the actual work, not just read from books or like hear from other people. I'm actually dealing with tobacco use with my own hands. Like I literally, so many times, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's curing or fermentation, that it's, you know, be, regardless of hard work, regardless of hard work, that that direct feeling that you know you're growing, that you're learning um, to getting better, to, to, you know, later on to not, not only just fulfill myself, but also I want, like, you know, every time I realize that I can actually explain and tell people more about tobacco use, you know, for, for people who like cigar smokers, cigar lovers, who want to know more, they didn't get a chance. That for me is the fact that I can actually start to show them about more, you know, details. It makes me happy. It really does. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's, I just trying to make cigars that people enjoy. And along the way, I want to become more knowledgeable and, you know, so I can share to other people. I have more things we can talk about. Yeah. You know? Um you know, it's it's and also think about this, like um you know you don't you don't see you don't see not only Chinese people but also Asian people working in this industry. Not not at all in Nicaragua. No. I'm the only one. <laughs> but right, but you know, because because People always have this false like impression of oh like cigar. When you think about cigar, you automatically relate to Latino community, which mm -hmm. yes, you know they have a lot of like family heritage stuff like that. But that doesn't necessarily mean other races cannot participate, right? So like when, when sometimes besides besides you know it's my own passion. Also, I'm actually thinking about you know maybe maybe one day. You know, maybe one day after I'm doing all this, all these years, maybe one day that, you know, kids from another race, when he read about my story, he could get encouraged to go after what he thinks is the right thing to do for him. Because, you know, like sometimes it's this, this like, you know, stereotypical things stuck in our head so strong that they actually stop us from doing things that we really love. Because we're so scared, like so concerned about being judged, like oh my god, why would you know? It's just like there are people who question me, like okay, why are Chinese still trying to do this? Like what's wrong with you? I was like nothing. It's just trying to prove a point. Mm -hmm. You know, it was never about race. It was just about you know what doing what you really love and never give up. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure you know. I, I can speak from personal experience that sometimes being the other in the room, you know, when you, you are a minority, right. you just, you get to the point where you don't notice it. And so you just, you're used to it and it kind of builds you up to, to be able to handle a whole bunch of different situations. So right. I'm sure that it, you were the same way, like to, oh, yeah. to them, like you were like, you know, like what's this person doing here? Yep. Um, you know, is he, you know, just, you know, like why? <laughs> but, exactly. But, like, oh, am I am I in the wrong neighborhood? Like, what's going on today? Right. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's 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 like I said. I'm, I'm sure for you, you were just you were really there to to learn this craft, right. um, and to understand this industry a lot better. And I think yeah. that's very different from a lot of people in the industry because a lot of people kind of do it the reverse. Like they work in the industry a long time. They may start off in retail. They may start off as a brand owner and then they have a few trips down to Nicaragua or Honduras or Dominican Republic and they kind of, you know, dabble their hands in it. But for you to go there and work <laughs> and and like you, you you know, get there five o'clock in the morning and, and don't leave until six o'clock at night. Exactly. I mean, that's like a lot. And you were just like, but you're probably more knowledgeable about this than a lot of people in the industry now. I mean, like just the processes. So when you talk about cigars and you're thinking about blending, 
you're right. probably thinking of it in a completely different way than most people because you're, I mean, you were hands on. Yeah, hundred percent. Like when, when you, you know now, when I'm thinking about lens, I'm actually you know you gotta think about. I'm capable of thinking from a different dimension, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But I know for sure. I only know that because I got my hands on experience. You know, not only at the factory, but also in the farm, all that. That's why I know X Y Z. Yeah. So, at what point did you meet Luciano? It was. Yeah, for the first trip. Yeah, the first trip, I like I met him very shortly. You know, we didn't get a lot of time to talk for the first time because, you know, the first trip, I only stayed there for two weeks. And then, you know, after that, I felt like, like you know, I just fell in love with the environment. So I decided to go in there for two months. The second time, I was like, okay, I got to live there now and learn. And, you know... I started to realize that I started meeting, you know, meeting like Roblox and stuff like that. Because a lot of times um, when you're trying to talk to like family around business, stuff like that, of course, I understand, you know, it's their family secret. So they're not going to try to teach you right away, like especially when they don't know you. Right. And but to me, I know like if I want to get them better to get to the next level, I need I need to learn all of this. So I just start to, you know, knock on people's doors. And uh, luckily enough, you know, Luciano took me. He's just, because, you know, he, he saw me not only like as some of those random do, like just like, oh, I want to have a cigar brand. Here's the band and make me this, this, this. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, because you actually said different things. You said you want to learn not just the, you know, only a brand, but also it seems like you're more interested in the tobacco leaves. Yeah, I am. So just let, let me, uh, let me took you in and uh, see how, you know, how you can, how you work it out. That's uh, the rest of history. It's, yeah, ever since. So do you ever think about how, you know, you could have met anyone in Nicaragua and you could have, you know, not on some other cigar factory's door and they could have taken you in as well and you've been on a completely different trajectory um do you ever think about that like how life and fate kind of just lined up and it was like here you know whatever force out there was just like i'm gonna put you in front of luciano right now <laughs> and yeah i uh, you know sometimes I, I thought about it you know thought about the uh, what ifs mm -hmm. then i realized that it's it's probably the best way you know, the best way to me is the way that's already happened. Yeah. I always believe that. I don't, I'm a person where, I don't know since when, but I just, you know, I don't, I really don't care about the what ifs anymore. Because I believe, you know, the, the way that certain things happen, it's probably the best way. Because at least, at least me to here today to talk about it. And this, this is the reality. And, you know, if it's reality, then must be, you know, it definitely means it's probably one of the best way that, you know, there could possibly be. So how did your uh, first cigar, Y Panda, mm -hmm. come about? Well, oh, you mean like how did I, how did it, how did you make it happen? Or mm -hmm. Yeah, how did you make it happen? Right. And what was your inspiration for it? Um, you know, when me and Luch, we, because we make the blends together, like we're going back and forth. He got some ideas. I thought, oh, maybe we should try this. I got some idea. You know, Luch goes, oh, maybe we should try this. You know, this is more like the result of, you know, two, like two individuals came from different cultural background and you work together for, some, you know, for one goal, which is creative, a blend that different enough but also you try to make it people to enjoy it so you make it different not because oh you're just trying to make something different um we figured you know we picked this one just because um because this one is more like a mild plus you know medium minus strength level cigar and then you know 
full flavor. So we finally decided to go with this one as the first one. It's because, you know, we're trying to, you know, make it a more fun experience for people to challenge them. Because typically speaking, when people think about a mild cigar, you always automatically think about, oh, like a lighter color wrapper or like a mm-hmm. connect, right? But that's not naturally true. That, that's why, you know, at the show, why I tell people like, oh, yeah, look at this color. I know it's Habano. I know it's Colorado, but it's actually a mild cigar. A lot of people blow it away. But that's just because, you know, a lot of times when people look at natural color or like a Colorado color, they automatically think, oh, it's going to be like at least minimum, like medium, medium strength. Now, just because we do that all these years doesn't mean that's the truth, right? Because a lot of times the strength of a cigar is actually came from the Lijero, right? It's not about, well, there's, there's like the strong on flavor profile and also there's strong on nicotine content. Now, a lot of a lot of times people think about, you know, a strong cigar, they talk about like nicotine, nicotine content, right? And that requires the hero. And for us, we we're like, I don't, like, I'm not, you know, not against it, but also at the same time, like, I want something to smoke where there's a lot of flavor, I can enjoy it, but without worry about you pull my ass out. Because, you know, a lot of times the first cigar, I don't want to smoke a full body. Right. right. So that's when we decide, you know what, let's uh, introduce this experience to other people. You know, pretty much we won't give people a different option for the first cigar of their day or like a morning cigar. Um, and, you know, with, with the flavor, creamy, nutty, sweet, a little bit spicy on the retro hill. I think, you know, it's, it's definitely both friendly for new beginners. Um, or like for experienced smart smoker where you just want to have easy smoke. Yeah, and I definitely felt like when I tried this cigar, it was, as you said, because I didn't hear, I didn't, I don't like to read press releases before I try new cigars because mm-hmm. I was like, let me see what experience I have. And then I'll go read the press release. Right. So I, I had been dealing with so many press releases anyway. It's like I had dealt with the one for your cigar and I can't remember you know, I couldn't recall like the details. And I was like, that's good. So when I had it, I felt like it, now that you say that it's, a, you know, a good morning cigar, right. like it doesn't hit you right in the face. Cause there's a lot of cigars that two puffs in and, and you, you get like hit with spice or, or right. lots of strength. Um, for me, I felt like it was a gradual thing. And I don't know if that was intentional or not. Like mm-hmm. the flavor, the strength, it's like a gradual, you know, build up. And it wasn't until like halfway through that all of a sudden it's like you, you're rewarded for your patience. That's what I wrote down in my notes. It's like you're rewarded for your patience of sticking with the cigar. Because then like all the, the complexity and stuff right. kind of come, comes in, at least for me. Like I said, I don't feel like I'm a good cigar reviewer. So I don't really get into that lane of uh, the media. But I did think it was a really interesting, you know. I mean, you know, at at the end of the day, I think flavor is one thing. You know, if if you if you got a palate or, you know, if you're really into details, sure, you know, good for you, you can get those. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only way for you to enjoy the cigar. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, to me, all matters is that uh, everyone who tried that cigar, you enjoy the experience. Doesn't matter if you can explain that words by words. The key is... At the end of the day, let's be honest. I ask you, okay, do you think that money is well spent? The answer right. is yes. That's all matters, right? Because, I mean, there are all kinds of people with different – this industry is full of people with different, you know, backgrounds, stuff like that, professions. You can't really expect everyone to be at the one certain level, right? I mean, it's just because fundamentally we're just a bunch of guys and women – who find to have a good time, you know, have the great experience that make ourselves happy. So I think once, as long as you can do that, that that's all that matters. <laughs> you, know? you know, I was thinking about that a couple of weekends ago, um, because the weekends is, is when I will try out a new cigar mm-hmm. usually. Um, and I challenge myself kind of like what you did uh, right. with your journey to try out a new cigar, like don't smoke the same thing just to kind of see what else is out there. And I was thinking, 
there's so much pressure in the cigar industry for people to, like you said, be experts. Like everyone has to be a reviewer. Everyone has to pick out the exact flavor notes. Right. Um, and, and you kind of, I feel like, and I was just like having this moment where it was like, can you just like enjoy a cigar? You know, like, can you yeah, just like I, enjoy I, it? Like, I like, why do I need to like, why do I need to sit here and try to say, oh, it, it's like this flavor note or that flavor note? Like, right. you know, like, why can't we just have a review? That's like you said, like, was it worth your money? Yes, no. <laughs> you know, would you exactly. buy it? Yes, no. Yeah. Um, you know, it had that be just as valuable as one of these. Because some of these reviews I read, like, they're so long and in-depth. I'm like, I didn't get any of that. Like, I just, you know, like, it, it's tobacco. I don't know. And it's not flavored tobacco. It's not, like, infused with flavor. It's, like, right. tobacco. Yep. And I know it stimulates parts of your palate that make you, that you say, like, oh, it's, like, stimulating like the sweet spot in your tongue or the, the salty part of your tongue. But it's like, we don't talk about it like that. We talk about like, oh, this is, you know, this is like a, a sweet, you know, right. part. And, I've, it, and that drives me crazy. And that always drives me crazy. And that's one of my things I always complain about on Deep Cuts is like cigar reviews like that. Because I just feel like there's so much pressure for everyone to be a good reviewer. And then yeah. you're missing the point in a cigar. That's my time. It, <laughs> It's, it's just like, you know, sometimes when you have barbecue, right? Really good barbecue, like, come on. They're like, who gives a shit, like, all the flavor profile details? Oh, like, I first taste a little bit, like, charcoal or, like, cherry wood. No. Is it good? Yeah. Is the meat good? Yeah. Are you going to are you gonna try to eat again? Of course. That's all that matters. I mean, because, I mean, come on, think about it. You're not asked, like, those kind of questions at a family meal, because if you do, people will look at you like, are you done? Because I'm trying to, and like, I, I don't know all the fancy words you use, but I just know I'm going to have more of them. Right, exactly. Because, you know, sometimes it's it's like, oh, oh yeah, that's actually one of the, uh, another reason me and Luch, we did it. Because we try to make it to, uh, to a point where it's complex enough where you just don't want to think about it, the flavor detail. You just like, I don't hear it anymore. I just enjoy the cigar. I don't know what else to tell you. Like, you know what? And now that you say that with 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 your cigar, maybe that was what I was experiencing because it wasn't a very straightforward, like you know, like like the, like there's no like specific part of the tongue that was stimulated. It was kind of right. like all over the place, and it was like you know, it was like what am I experiencing? Am I, am I experiencing flavor? Am I not yeah. experiencing flavor? So it is complex to the part, like, like you say, you kind of, you're forced to kind of say like, you know, do I like the cigar or not? And right. Am I going to continue smoking it or not? And I think yeah. that's, like I said, I think that's a good, to me, like you said, that's a different experience than what you're used to because there's so many cigars that like say, they either oh, try to knock your yeah. socks off mm -hmm. five, five puffs in or, you know, or it's just made to be like, you know, so mild and, and light that you don't have any, you know, feeling about it. You're just like, yeah, that's right. that. That was seven dollars I spent. <laughs> just, you know, so sometimes, like it's you know, we're, we're living in the world where everyone is trying to tell you too much information. Everything seems like come with filters, but then I said, no, it's just I'm gonna do the opposite way. Let's just simplify everything because look, I just want this cigar to be like we were smoking. You, you enjoy so much. And then, you know, you, you you forget about it. And then, you know, you just try to enjoy the conversation or whatever. And then later on, it seems like, oh, let me just try to smoke again to get a flavor profile. You know, it's just like every time, oh, yeah, it's a good cigar. Like you just, you know, because you enjoyed it so much, you start to, you know, you stop actually worrying about the flavor details. I think that sometimes it's it's more important than the flavor profile itself of a cigar. It's that uh, through this I actually offer you a great experience. I think that's more valuable. So Luciano as a mentor, because mm -hmm. I, I feel like he's becoming like a mentor to a lot of people because right. especially like I, I've spoken to Mike or Mike the Greek, mm -hmm. as some people know, you know, he talked about how that he has that mentor relationship with Luciano. Right. So, for you, what did you, you know, if you had to kind of extract one big thing that you learned from working with Luciano, like what would that one big lesson be that he kind of taught you that you weren't going to get anywhere else? 
Um, I would say one thing, one of the most important thing I learned from Mooch is that, uh, you know, um, sometimes if you want to go farther or like, you know, get to next level, you need to be willing to share, to elevate other people. Mm. So that, yeah, um, you know, if once you start to elevate other people higher, and then they can actually reach out with their hands, elevate you to a higher place. Then before, you know, compare just by yourself, you work so hard, all that stuff. I guess, you know, that's one of the most important thing because, you know, Luch has every single right to not share any of the knowledge he knows. Of course, I understand. But, you know, instead of that, he's doing the opposite. He's willing to share and teach me all of this and uh, to a point where now me and him, we can actually start discussing on, um, you know, tobacco leaves and also blends. Actually, sometimes I can, you know, give my advice and Luch will take that and we actually growing together, you know, elevate each other with higher places. I think sometimes it's, you'd be surprised how big, you know, how, how, how big a heart he has. It's just, that's what makes him different. Let's see. So for you, where do you want to go in the cigar industry? Like, do you want to have to be a brand owner? Do you want to like, because uh, you you've had experiences, like seems like in, in all the different areas of the, the cigar industry from, you know, retail right. to, to factory, <laughs> which right. a lot of people can say to now, you know, creating this, you know, having the experience of creating a brand. So mm -hmm. you tried out all these different things. Where do you see yourself going? Well, I'd say I put uh, I put the owner of a brand at the very bottom of the list because you know to me it's it's nice it sounds nice but also um, the most passionate thing I about it you know for me is about you know I'm I'm always identify myself as a tobacco peasant and uh, you know and a cigar blender you know I. I um, I enjoy doing those and also, you know, I always tell people I'm, you know, I'm more like, I'm still more of a student or like apprentice of uh, Luciano. So that to be said, I think where I'm going is always got to, you know, lead with those three things first, you know, because I want to show people that not only Luciano is a really good cigar blender, a blend master himself, but also he can actually teach people, train people to a really high level too. I want you know, I want to use myself to prove that point. And also, you know, besides that, I love I'd love to call myself, like I said, you know, a tobacco peasant and also a star blender. Because to me it's just like where I'm going is just to a point I just trying to learn more about tobacco leaves and make keep keep pushing more new blends that people enjoy that you know, so I can travel around the world and go to any shop and have a conversation with a guy. You know, just that I think that that's my idea. Like brand owner, all that stuff. Yes, it's important somewhat, you know, but not as effective as the other things to me in the industry. Like I'm, I'm yeah, I like to keep it simple. Yeah. Um, do you have a philosophy that you live by? Oh yeah, absolutely. No matter what, never, leave, never, never leave, uh, never leave regrets, and stay true to yourself. I always, I always try my best to live by these two things. You know, just it's a lot about make my life easier because it just helped me to make choices easier. So I want you to, so we can close out this part of the interview. I want you to. Finish the sentence. Panda is. Hmm. Panda is. I really want to say panda is Chinese, but that's just kind of obvious. <laughs> panda is. Uh, 
That is real and unique. Say, so, yeah, trust me, because uh, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, doing an interview or like later on you saw me on the street, you'll be like, yeah, this dude he's weird and unique. You really can't find another person like him. <laughs> well, so definitely that. Well, can you tell people? You know, you talked about your cigar, Wise Panda. Um, how can people keep in touch with, you know, keep up with you on social media? Where can they find your cigars, you know, and everything else that you, you, you're doing in the industry? How can they keep up with you, basically? Well, mainly two things, right? The first one is, uh, like, I only have uh, one social media, which is uh, Instagram which is uh, also, you know, on here as well. My IG number is Y underscore is underscore Panda. So, you know, on there, I'll post a lot of stuff, you know, basically like stuff I'm doing like in the States or like what I've been doing every day in Nicaragua. That's the first way. The second way is actually probably better. It's just like, you never know. I might stop by at any shops that carries my brand and, you know, stop by, have a conversation with people. I, I prefer, you know, talking to people and, you know, an actual person. Yes. Better. Well, awesome. And, uh, oh, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, as long as a shop that carries Luciano, there would be a really high chance that carries White Panda. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you for coming on to Deep Cuts Live. And for those people who are watching or listening, um, if you want to catch any of this episode, if you miss any part of it, you can view the entire video on youtube.com slash deep cuts live, or you can go to deep cuts live.com and it will be uh, on the website as well. And also you can listen to just the audio of this episode or all the other 130 some episodes of deep cuts live. Um, we're on all the different podcasting platforms like Apple and Spotify, our heart radio, you name it. We're probably there. Um, so leave a review. Those always help me to make the show better um so you're not gonna hurt my make feelings sure. it's, it's yeah, I'll, I'll make sure to subscribe subscribe onto on deep cuts yeah and um and also for those watching um me and panda are getting ready to go off and film uh a couple other little things that will trickle out on social media over the next right. couple of weeks so um there's plenty more uh of this interview to kind of watch and uh on the YouTube channel. So thank you again for watching and until next time. Absolutely.